So greetings, everyone. Uh, this is 1101 in Boulder, Colorado, and we'll get started. So thank you all very much for joining the webinar of the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, also known as, also known as the NCCASC, uh, which is based at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, we bring you these webinars to facilitate a discussion of science, research, and best practices related to adaptation and resource management under a rapidly changing climate with the focus on the North Central US uh, that encompasses the, the Missouri and the upper Colorado River basins. Um, I'm Imtiaz Rangwala, climate science lead at the NCCASC, uh, and I'm co-hosting this webinar with Heather Yoakum, who is our stakeholder and communications lead. So before I introduce our wonderful speakers uh, for today, a quick word on housekeeping. Um, the audio for all participants will remain muted during the webinar, uh, but you will have the ability to unmute during the Q&A. Uh, we, however, encourage you to submit your questions via the chat box during the webinar. Uh, and finally, I'm very excited to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, I've had personally uh, great pleasure and good fortune to work with them for many years on a few different projects, and especially the one that will be discussed today. Um, our first speaker will be Rene Rondo. Um, Rene is a conservation planner and ecologist with the Colorado Natural Heritage Program, uh, or CNHP, uh, which is based at the Colorado State University, Fort Collins. Um, she has been with CNHP since 1992 and has had the opportunity to work as a, bo as a botanist, ecologist, its director, and a conservation planner. Um, her 28 years of ecological fieldwork in Colorado has allowed her to sample all of Colorado's major ecosystems and collect, and collect rare species information from alpine to prairie, prairie zones. In addition to working in Colorado, Rene has also collected flora and fauna data from Venezuela, Mexico, British Virgin, Virgin Islands, Solomon Islands, Guam, New Guinea, and Palau. Uh, her numerous monitoring projects has allowed her to witness climate change associated ecological changes and her current interest is working on climate change projects that include vulnerability assessments and adaptation strategies. Uh, however, fieldwork is still an annual event that grounds her in reality. Renee strongly believes that private public partnerships that includes social and ecological aspects are critical to conserving Colorado's biodiversity. Following Renee will be Andrew Brebot. Uh, Andrew is a hydrologist and a watershed specialist with the Bureau of Land Management at its Gunnison Field Office. He works on a variety of issues uh, that includes habit habitat restoration for fisheries and the Gunnison sage grouse. Um, climate change adaptation and road management. Uh, he works with partners throughout the Upper Gunnison Basin uh, to, to accomplish habitat and water quality improvement projects. Um, he's also an integral member of the Gunnison Climate Working Group, uh, consisting of local, state, federal, and nonprofit partners uh, working together to restore brooding, brood rearing habitat of the Gunnison sage grouse. And our final speaker, will be Marcy Bidwell. Marcy is the executive director of the Mountain Studies Institute, or MSI, uh, based in uh, Durango and Silverton, Colorado. Uh, MSI is an independent nonprofit mountain research and education center established in 2002. And it connects communities, scientists, agencies, tribes, and other stakeholders across the San Juan mountain region uh, to facilitate meaningful application of science uh, that makes a difference to its communities and the quality of its environment upon which they depend. Um, throughout her diverse professional experience, Marcy has worked with scientists and citizens to manage, design, and facilitate uh, community-based community projects for the restoration and management of public and private lands. Um, and with that, I will uh, ask Renee to please take it away. Ah, thank you. Thank you, MTS. Thank you all for joining. Uh, it's rainy and chilly where I am right now, which is just outside of Durango, not too far from Marcy. 
Um, and uh, it has just been such a pleasure to work with MTS over the last, uh, I think I think I first met him maybe in 2012. I'm not exactly sure what date, um, but uh, it's, it's really been a joy to work with you, MTS. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll start the presentation off. This is a, a project that was funded by the North Central Climate Science Center. That's what it was named then. Um, and that funding uh, went for three years. And what I've done here is put the logos of the institutes, the organizations that our co-PIs are, are with. And so rather than uh, put all the names of our co-PIs, uh, some, some of these institutes, there's multiple PIs here. Um, so uh, on behalf of what we call our Seeker Social Ecological Climate Resilience Project, I really thank all of the co-PIs that are, are not uh, speaking today. Uh, we could not have done it without them. So we'll just dive into it and I'll, I'll give you an idea of, of where we're at. Uh, we are in southwest Colorado, and this uh, satellite image on the right-hand side, uh, this red box in here is our study area, and that's in southwest Colorado. You can see it's the Four Corners states, so Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. Uh, part of our San Juan Basin um, is within the Colorado Plateau ecoregion. Uh, the Rocky Mountains are uh, definitely a, a big player in these areas. And um, to, to give you a flavor, a couple photos from the Gunnison Basin area, our focal landscape over there, it too, um, the sagebrush. There's about a half a million acres of sagebrush in this area. It's a high elevation. This photo here on the left is taken from about 8,000 feet. The town of Gunnison is about 7,000 feet in elevation. The high peaks go up to 14,000 foot. Um, it's, this landscape is very important for uh, our federally listed species, the Gunnison sage grouse, and I know uh, Andrew will talk about that a bit later. Um, it's a very important landscape, not just for these birds, but for wildlife and uh, people. Uh, about most, a lot of this landscape is uh, publicly owned, BLM Forest Service especially, uh, but there's uh, private inholdings all over the place. Um, so private-public partnership is very important. And within this landscape, um, it's punctuated by these wetlands and these wet meadows, uh, seep springs and small streams. And while they occupy less than 2% of this landscape, they're really critical to uh, people and nature. And this is an area where uh, scientists and uh, cows get along quite well, as you can see from this picture up here. In fact, the scientist, uh, it doesn't seem to even know about those cows behind her. Um, so it's a very tight-knit community. Um, uh, these folks that live here um, know it quite well and they're very engaged in it. Um, our other focal landscape in this area that crosses both basins is the spruce fir landscape. It's, it's quite large. Um, if you ever come to Colorado to go skiing in the winter time, you will most likely be seen in our spruce fir landscape. It's uh, dominated by snow in the winter time. Uh, in fact, our peak snowfall is Wolf Creek Pass area in the San Juan Basin with over 40 feet of snow per year. That's like 13 meters. Um, and uh, the area is very important for elk summer range. Um, and because it has all this snow in the, in the winter time, it, there's a plethora of wetlands in this area. And Moving down into the San Juan Basin, uh, a little drier. This, uh, from these photos, you can tell we're we're at the edge of the Colorado Plateau. You get these large mesas, dissected by these canyons that uh, often have cliffs, sandstone cliffs. In fact, uh, this picture over here uh, is um, a picture of Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde National Park, famous for uh, supporting. Um, the ancestral Puebloans, uh, these, pal these cliff dwellings were built in about 1200 AD. Um, prior to the cliff dwellings, uh, the population of people lived up mostly on the mesa tops. 
and uh, farmed the mesa tops as well as uh, hunting. The area is dominated by pinyon pines and uh, pinyon pines are uh, really important for pinyon jays. So both of these sites have two have birds that um, have been declining and are of a lot of interest to the um, ecological science. And uh, pinyon pines, if you haven't experienced it, they create this great nut and often goes into pesto, um, really rich, but full of nutrition, fat, uh, protein, etc. And not only do the birds or the, the birds rely on it, um, but uh, people really relish this plant as well. Both of these communities, uh, the Gunnison and the San Juan Basin are agricultural communities um, that uh, have a lot of irrigated hay meadows, the ranching operations, um, some small farming operations. And uh, they've been part of this landscape for a long time. But in addition, these, both of these landscapes have these relatively small towns on the west slope of Colorado. Uh, this photo is looking down at Durango where Marcy and I live. And uh, this is the largest community in both of these basins. It's about a population of so about 20,000 people. It's a typical Old West, New West um, meeting together. You can easily go out and uh, get your latte or go get your microbrews. Uh, and if you're so bold, you can walk across the street and, and buy a a joint from one of our dispensaries. So it's a, uh, but at the same time, you go down to the diner and uh, talk to the local ranchers uh, and farmers that are using this area. So a pretty diverse area from both a uh, people and uh, ecological perspective. So for us um, to do this project, we've got to, to, to be part of this community, right? And we've got to build this trust and we've got to share knowledge and create knowledge uh, about how everything is working, social and ecological. So we did this uh, in, the, in the two groups um, with over 70 stakeholders representing more than 20 organizations. And, and these folks dedicated their time um, to come into the stakeholder meetings. This effort went on for three years. And I have to say, uh, these groups are still together, they're still working together, and they just morph into a different uh, what's, what's important and, and moving forward with uh, actually putting climate adaptation on the ground. And we'll hear more about that right at the end. Um, so really, thank, thanks to all of our stakeholders. Um, they obviously become your friends uh, because uh, we spend a lot of time eating donuts and drinking coffee and occasionally having happy hour. A very important part of that project. So the, there's three principles that we uh, followed and we said what we really want to do is we want to bring a climate system and the social systems and the ecological systems together and we and we want to focus on those three sectors and so our co-PIs are, are within each one of these sectors and it strengthens the whole project by by thinking about all three of these sectors. Um, we followed this typical climate smart conservation, Stein et al, Murphy et al, and Cross et al, very similar planning uh, circles, if you will. And we, we followed this fairly closely. We deviated from it um, when necessary. And I'm not gonna go into it in detail because as we go through the steps, I'll, I'll point them out to you. And um, let me give you a flavor for what our current climate is like. I, I think, um, like many of you, we are, have already experienced uh, climate change. It's, it's, it's happening. It's happening now. I, I need a book bumper sticker that says climate change is already happening. And um, from this graph here, this is a Palmer drought severity index. And you can see the red bars represent a drought and the blue bars represent wet years. In 2002, 2018, and now 2020, right now are very significant droughts. And um, the frequency and the severity of these droughts uh, look like they're going up. And we'll see from our uh, climate center areas that is uh, very probable. Um, droughts get people's attention, no question about that. And so 
we're experiencing current droughts, but in addition, we have these other things that are going on. Uh, this is dust on snow events. This is, I don't know how widespread this gets outside of Colorado, but um, we have this unique situation where Colorado Plateau, especially in Arizona in the springtime, the wind comes from that area, picks up a lot of this bare ground that's uh, been increasing because of the droughts that they're having. Um, and that dust blows to, towards the San Juan Mountains and often can get all the way into the Gunnison Basin as well. And these big, uh, from the photo on the top, you can see a dusty bend has just happened. It turns the snow brown. And by turning the snow brown, it changes the albedo and the snow melts faster. And you can see down on these photos here, there's this profile of dust in the snow. So it's multiple events in one winter. And scientists have been studying it for a while. And what they found is that a peak runoff can often be three weeks earlier. And in these extreme dust events like 2009, 2010, and 2013, it can actually be six weeks earlier. And since this is such a snow-driven system that we're in, the deep soil moisture that actually keeps the uh, vegetation growing all summer long, is really coming from this snow. So the faster it runs off, the less water we have in the summertime. So uh, the reservoirs may not make a big difference whether there's dust on snow, actual vegetation, the whole system, um, is really suffering from having this runoff happen earlier. For, for our project, remember we've got this sector of what is the climate, what's the climate palette look like, and we have future climate scenarios thanks to MTS, and this graph here depicts what MTS was looking at. Um, we're looking at the year 2035 going up to 2050, so mid-century range. And out of 72 model runs, you can see there's temperature on the uh, y-axis and precipitation on the x-axis. And um, MTS chose three different scenarios. This, we, we given them names. It's a little easier than talking about the actual um, uh, run itself. So hot and dry, uh, where it's really hot. And as you can see, sometimes the uh, scenarios project a um, loss in precipitation, other times uh, gain in precipitation. So our warm and wet is denoting that uh, we might get an uh, increase in annual precipitation. Hot and dry is depicting a scenario where we're likely to get less precipitation. Feast and famine is right in the middle. And so these three climate scenarios allow us to um, look at the uncertainty um, that future climate has. And we spent a lot of time right in the beginning trying to depict what, what does that mean? What does climate uncertainty mean? And so uh, we developed these tables that looked at different variables, uh, whether it's temperature, heat waves, droughts, wildfire, et cetera, and asked how do they range across those three different scenarios? <clears throat> Again, thanks to MTS, we can see that more frequent drought years like 2002, 2012, the one that we're having now, uh, may occur every five years. That is, that is a lot. In fact, the ranchers say that it's really hard to recover from these droughts. It can take five to seven years. So if you're having a drought every five years, it basically means you have no time to recover. Same for our ecological systems as well. It really takes time to recover from these extreme events. Um, so we're trying to capture those variables, put it into text, put it into maps, and um, MTS has done a great job of sharing how climate works with us. Um, this is just one of, of the many outputs that we have at our fingertips. We could take that and we could ask what are the top impacts across the three climate scenarios? No question, drought uh, comes to the top and uh, drought gives us plant mortality. Uh, this photo here is of conifers dying from uh, insect beetle kill. Um, fire, the uh, fire risk goes way up. Our, uh, the number of acres burning every year is much, much higher than it used to be. And it started in about 2002. And then especially in our warm and wet scenario, invasive species uh, is the perfect storm. 
for invasive species. So those are definitely the top impacts to our systems. And then you could ask, well, how does it impact people? Because it's, a, it's obviously a trickle down as well. So to, to, to ask that question, how does it impact people? We developed um, narratives for each one of these scenarios. They're just two pages, they're double spaced, they're quickly read, and they're based on the best available science, but they give a story, snapshot as to what the future might look like. And uh, these were used by uh, our social scientists to interview folks, to uh, develop some focus groups and some workshops, and walk through these, ask some questions, and get a, a feel for how managers, landowners might act um, or react to these different scenarios. And switching back over to the ecological response. Okay, so we know it's getting hotter. We know it might get drier. We know the storms might be bigger. Um, there's, there's a lot of things we, we can get from future climate change. But how does that translate into the systems, these landscapes that we're working and living in? And so we developed these ecological response models. Your eyes may roll when you, you, when you look at this, but from an ecological perspective, we can make a lot of sense. And so we can ask the questions, hey, this montane sagebrush that we're looking at, with these different models, knowing that what montane sagebrush needs, it is most likely going to shift up in elevation, especially in a hot and dry, that's this HD, um, most likely going to shift up in elevation. Um, whereas our seeps and springs, uh, part of this landscape, very important part of this landscape, uh, are likely to decrease in numbers and volume, especially in the hot and dry and feast and famine scenarios. So this starts to unravel the different pieces within these landscapes and, and we can denote that drought, altered fire regime, and invasive species are, are uh, important player in all of this. Again, your eyes might roll, um, so this isn't for everybody. So we also took the opportunity to uh, ex express what this means by looking at maps. Maps resonate with people. We, uh, we developed these bioclimate niche models, uh, working with Forest Service, USGS, and, and CNHP. And these bioclimate model, models, this is one just for sagebrush, the mountain big sagebrush. And this is for the hot and dry scenario. And so it's exactly what we're looking at. And this is the Gunnison Basin. And um, the red denotes that by mid-century, the climate in this area will not be suitable for regeneration of sagebrush. It doesn't mean the sagebrush is gone, but it does have to regenerate. So if a fire comes through, a big drought comes through and kills the plants, it's unlikely to regenerate back into the sagebrush. So we call that lost, it's a lost zone. And then this yellow is, um, Threatened, we, it looks like many years might not be favorable to regeneration, but there'll still be some years that are favorable to regenerate. So we expect to age brush, but it um, may not be as vigorous as we have it today. And this black area denotes uh, what we call persistent. This is the climate remains suitable for regeneration. Um, I'm, we're going to switch those words and instead of using persistent, uh, we'll switch and call that a climate refugio. Um, so that means the climate is suitable to maintain the current uh, landscape that we, we are seeing right now. This blue area, which is quite a bit of this map, is what we call this emergent zone. And that is the climate is currently not suitable for sagebrush but it's very likely to become suitable for this species. It doesn't mean the species will be there, it's gotta get there, right? Um, but for sagebrush, Rocky Mountain Biological Lab is up here just north of Crested Butte, and they have already been reporting sagebrush moving up in elevation. So that's already happening, and this map gives you an idea. So this is, has been a very useful tool for us because it's easy to show change. And change is what we're talking about here. And um, uh, when you can see this map, you can also see that strategies 
climate adaptation strategies associated with each one of these zones are most likely going to be different. You know, the, same, the strategy used for a lost zone is very different than a strategy that you use for a persistent climate refugia. So um, we'll keep that in the back of our mind as we move forward. So we have all this information at our fingertips. We're now in the like year two, and um, we are we have a list of impacts for our landscapes. And for each one of those impacts, we can ask what are the actions or action that could offset or mitigate um, these changes that are coming our way. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, um, but we do connect the two. And by doing this, you can then start to prioritize. Um, what are the top actions and what are the top strategies for the area? In order to prioritize, we really needed to think about um, our goals. And having a goal, a shared common goal, uh, allows the conversations to just be a little easier to um, have and to prioritize. So notice the last phrase here is in the face of a changing climate very important that our goals are considering uh, the future climate. So again, I'm not going to go through this, but goals are important. So our overarching strategies that we developed, and it doesn't matter which basin we're in, uh, they still apply, and that is to identify and protect those the climate refugia, those persistent areas. And um, proactive treatment for resilience means um, our our nature um, as, um, uh, as, good a, in a, as good a condition as possible, then um, much more resilient to uh, uh, what's coming down the pipe, right? And our last one is accept, assist, and allow transformation. <clears throat> and there's no question, this one, that's that blue zone on that map and the red zone on that map. And this one, our um, social scientist uh, discovered that is the hardest for people to accept and deal with. And so our social scientists are all there working with uh, focus groups, et cetera, definitely found transformation that people believed climate was impacting local systems, but they weren't necessarily prepared for large ecosystem transition and state changes. It's just, just hard for them to grasp. And that's a very important finding here. Um, another important finding is that drought risk resonates with people. It's something that we um, uh, are seeing quite a bit. And um, so when we can talk about droughts, we can get people to the table and it is something that uh, resonates. This uncertainty is, is huge, right? Welcome to uncertainty. And, People say they're comfortable with uncertainty. We use it every day. It's in our jobs. It's in our personal lives. Um, but when it comes to managing, they're really unsure how to manage given a range of possible futures. And that um, transformation area is the hardest. So uh, key findings before I turn it over uh, to, to uh, have, um, Andrew is that um, this collaborative, collaborative process uh, really works. Um, it really is strengthened by integrating the social and climate and ecological components, no question there. And um, having climate scenarios, these bioclimatic zone maps, ecological response models, are uh, definitely helping natural resource managers understand uncertainty. And we just talked about those three levels of strategies uh, across the landscape. And Marcy will talk about this last one. Can we take this template and transfer it to um, a different scale, a different place. And um, while we um, can adjust this like any good project, um, the answer is yes. And so a list of secret products, um, I think we're recording this, so hopefully um, you can get this. If not, just email us. Um, but we do have a lot of products out there, pro um, reports, publication, um, executive summary, et cetera. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew. And he is going to give us uh, an example of what this looks like when you actually go out on the ground, when you take one of these actions, 
and go out on the ground and do it. And it was done uh, with climate change in mind. And um, so, Andrew, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and give you our soapbox um, about wet metal restoration and the Gunnison Basin, which is a multi-stakeholder partnership working across fence lines. So when we think about climate change resiliency, uh, we're thinking on a landscape scale. Um, and so, we are working in uh, Music Meadows. Uh, as uh, Renee mentioned, these are critical for broodering habitat for the and sage grouse. So it was listed, listed in 2014 as threatened. And the crux of the gutters and sage grouse is the broodering habitat for the chicks. They need these, uh, these, uh, these Music Meadows uh, so that they can bulk up on protein you know, during the summer and so that they can survive the long winter. So we're working in these music meadows and we're trying to restore the hydrologic function of these systems so that during winter runoff and then monsoon runoff, they can, these systems can catch runoff, store it, and slowly release it. And as Renee mentioned, that makes the, that makes the that soil, mo it, it increases the soil moisture so that that uh, riparian wetland species vegetation can access it. Um, and we're trying to keep the sagebrush out of these music meadows. There's plenty of sagebrush in the, in the uplands. That is still critical as nesting habitat. Uh, next, please. Um, can you for that slide? Let's see. Oh, Renee or Heather, so can someone forward the slide? Hey, Andrew, all right. Okay, there we go. You okay, got there it? we go. All right. All right. Thanks. So, as we mentioned, like, you know, we're really trying to, like, you know, we're measuring res resiliency in these systems by the vegetation. Uh, we haven't been able to kind of hit, you know, kind of, uh, hit the soil moisture so the vegetation really kind of tells a story. So this graph, um, this is a, uh, you know, Renee's uh, vegetation monitoring. So it's got a lot of moving pieces in here. So I just want you to focus on one thing. The y-axis is wetland species cover. The uh, x-axis is time. The blue line shows the uh, treated areas and the orange are controls. And they aren't evenly weighted just because our group, we try to treat everything really to the chagrin of, uh, the, of the monitoring folks. But if you notice in the blue line, the, the treated area, we have a steeper um, slope. So we're seeing that indicating that we have a, we have a st steeper, uh, a, a faster rate of um, increase and wetland species cover than the, the uh, controls. And one thing that Renee touched upon is about the, about the, um, the ranchers, they say in a severe drought, it takes five to seven years for the area to recover. So if you look at 2018, that's a, that was a severe drought. And the following year, we have a steep, rapid uh, with a steep rate of increases showed as the slope between 2018 and 2019, which was a wet year as compared to the control. So that indicates that we're building resiliency in these uh, systems through our implementation strategies. And I'm going to show you some of the strategies that we've implemented on the ground. Um, next, please. Hmm. Yeah, it should just come up in just a second. I just switched it. Okay, thanks. Sorry, there's a little bit of a no, lag. I'm in Crested Butte, by the way, and they're in Renee's in Durango, and then NTS and Heather in Boulder. So uh, we appreciate <laughs> your patience there. Uh, so this is one of the kind of the, the ad implementation strategies that we use. Uh, this is called a plug and spread. Um, and so this is an area this is a broad alluvial valley. Before we put this plug and spread, water would just run down during, during an intense runoff event down the gully. And we wouldn't, and so, so what was happening here 
with this plug and spread is we're reweighting the whole uh, music meadow, the sponge. So we're saturating that meadow surface, getting that water store um, water so that the riparian wetland species can be um, can uh, take advantage of that available soil moisture, and then slowly release it. And it also helps that you know water doesn't just run down that gully; it's spreading out across the surface. And the next slide is going to show you kind of the effects. Um, so the photo on the left, you already saw that, but what I want to show you, this is a complex of plug and spreads, which you can't see. And what we did here is the water used to run down an old roadbed, a gully. And what the plug and spreads reconnected this music meadow surface. The white polygons show in 2017, one year after implementation, all that sagebrush that was killed off as we spread water out in the former music meadow. And so we, we're changing that. We're pushing the, that sagebrush out back in the uplands where it belongs and it's still needed for nesting habitat. And we're increasing that wetland, that riparian wetland uh, vegetation in the valley bottom. And the photo on the right shows you all that dead sagebrush. And this is just one, one growing season. In this area, this, um, this area is a grass bank. There's no grazing. Gudgeon and sage grouse use it. Uh, pronghorn antelope, elk, deer. Um, so it's a very important system. And you know, this, these areas occupy less than 2% of the landscape. And so we're trying to like, you know, reconnect these areas and restore them. Um, next, please. And what, yeah, thanks. So um, this is, a, this is um, these are called one rock dams. These are structures you can find in the Cienegas of Mesa Verde. Uh, they're just different. We're using rock. They use kind of uh, their clay kind of, um, their, um, clay structures, and I'm probably getting that wrong. But this is a ephemeral system. This, this system carries a high bed load. And this is our private land, we have grazing. And so the top left shows us with volunteers building you know, a complex of one rock dams in this ephemeral system in 2012. You know, there's a drought year. And if we go from uh, left to right, we can see that the, the, it's getting greener and that greenness is expanding. So what we've done here with, the, with this complex of one rock dams is that we've elevated the, that, the bed of that gully and we're kind of um, reconnecting the floodplain. And the vegetation monitoring actually showed us that, hey, we kind of uh, reached uh, asymptote kind of in that, in that slope and then it's time to put another layer on. And we did that. And so we actually expanded that from the floodplain into, the, um, into a terrace. And this is really kind of showing that resiliency in the system, that it not only works in these music meadows, but it works in these ephemeral high bed load systems. Next, please. So I just want to focus on the photos. Uh, we accomplished this work by Youth Corps. So the guys up in the top right with the hard hats on, led by Bill Zedike, who's mentored us. And he, he's the one who developed these uh, techniques in, in a couple of publications, let the water do the work. Bill's shown with, this, with that staff. He's the water whisperer. And then also in the bottom, we have volunteers. We've done quite a bit of work here uh, we made a lot of progress. And the re only reason we've been able to do this is because we're able to kind of like, we had that workshop in 2009 with TNC, CNHP, uh, and all these partners. And then in 2012, we're actually able to implement these strategies across the landscape. So we had, and the reason we're able to do this is we didn't have to reinvent the wheel because of the potential listing 
in 2012, the, the uh, Gunnison Sage Grouse um, Working Committee was already in place. So we just kind of piggybacked off of that and were able to kind of do this work. And like, uh, as you can see, we've restored uh, about 1,200 acres of brooding habitat since uh, 2012. Uh, next, please. I think that's, uh, Andrew, I think that's it. Okay, and so uh, Marcy's gonna talk to you about um, lessons learned in the Mako's watershed. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Marcy. Awesome, thank you. And uh, I'm really excited to be a part of this group and to see the progress in the Gunnison and the um, lessons that we've been able to bring to both the San Juan and the Gunnison Basin and how we can move those forward into the future. So I'm gonna tell our story um, in the San Juan Basin, looking at progress for the Mancus River watershed, which is actually taking the lessons we've learned um, from the Social Ecological Resilience Project and then thinking about how do we do it in um, a very specific place and bring it to the ground like they did in the Gunnison, but to do it faster and better um, and towards more, and continue to add to the legacy of results. So this picture sort of first, I wanna ground our minds in the Mancus River watershed. Many of you may have had the opportunity to live or to visit uh, the Four Corners region or to um, spend some time dipping your toes into a high mountain lake in the San Juans. What's so fascinating about the Mancus River watershed is that in a very short distance of 120 miles, it goes from um, mountain peaks that top out right around 13,000 feet, all the way down to the desert, um, desert and uh, badlands and red rock country of the, cor the Four Corners region. And along the way, it um, includes the homes and, um, and special meaning places and traditional hunting grounds of 4,000 people um, from an agricultural community um, to the Ute Mountain Ute tribe that uh, call it um, their sacred place. And um, so what you see here in front of you are some of the pictures that try to, to uh, portray that diversity and uh, the importance of that water that falls as snow and then transitions through that watershed. What we've really noticed is that um, we're part of that bullseye that centers around the Southwest uh, where we're seeing hotter and drier is a big part of our reality. And so as we think about that, holding on to water and how it um, stays in the system and how it enters groundwater is a really big piece of how we think about the future. And so with that, I wanted to kind of visit some lessons learned from the Seeker project that we're applying here in the Mancus River. And so the uh, lessons really center around trying to see um, what was it that was successful? What was our secret sauce in the Seeker project? And, um, and so basically it was trying to learn from making sure that even though we're taking the best available science that we are tailoring that um, to the management and um, to the situation that's specifically how people manage on our on, in our area what are the activities the actual like is it a log is it a timber sale is it managing recreation is it making sure we have enough uh, water for municipal use um, and how do we um, actually then take this climate adaptation process and and insert it into the decisions that are being made um, the other lesson that we learned is that to get at landscape scale you really have to engage uh, andrew said it reach across that fence um, and actually to even stop thinking about the world as having fence and lines on it, to think about it as uh, General Powell did in exploring the West as big watersheds, as the lines that we need to pay attention to on the ground. Um, the other one was to really be adaptive, um, to learn how to evaluate, adjust, and streamline the process. Um, as uh, Renee mentioned earlier on, we took that scenario planning process of telling the story of what it might look like in 2035 and then hearing people react and say what they would do if that was the world they lived in. It's one of those kind of choose your own adventure tactics that really worked in our region and helped us to engage people in those stories. And of course, um, 
using those scenarios also helped us really talk about uncertainty. Um, and this is lessons that have come from the social science around game theory and uh, what we're learning um, from some of the video games all the way back to Dungeons and Dragons is that game theory and using scenarios helps us understand uncertainty and helps us think about the if thens of the future. And that's been really important as to how um, how our project learned and even if you're following the science having time for that imaginability to reimagine what the future might look like and to challenge your assumptions was pretty important for us as a team and as a group and we're applying that now in the Minkus area let's talk about some barriers and some opportunities as well some of the other sides that we learned in this challenge um because um, barriers are um, things that don't have to get in your way, but it's important to recognize once we see that wall, we can figure out a way to go up, over, or around, right? And so one of the barriers to getting climate adaptation work to, to be able to succeed is, is truly funding. It comes up in our social science that we did in our area, but it comes up in every project. And um, really looking to share and be equitable in the resources that come forward so that you can help people have a seat at the table. And in our case in the Mancus, um, uh, one of our partners has been really um, proactive in making sure we have um, consulting fees that we can pay to farmers and ranchers. Uh, we are looking to try and fund seasonal employment for Ute Mountain Ute Tribe members to help with restoration in the future so that we can get people to the table. And then there's a real limit to capacity and agencies in particular, especially in dynamics where we have administrations changing um, every four years that change directives. There are real authorities and pieces to think through. Each partner can't do the same things. And each person's place on the landscape actually really adds up to what they're capable of doing. It's important to structure around that. And I think NEPA is, some, is a tool that we will see be adjusted as we go forward in the future so that good planning and thinking can also include uncertainty in the way we do that work. Stakeholder fatigue, man, it's real, right? And uh, if there's one thing that COVID and the pandemic has taught us is that we really are people first. And so designing a process that can be flexible and has an ability to balance the time commitment that people can really truly give versus how deep you wanna dive into the science. And so having a flexible participation plan is really important. On the opportunity side, really look for those opportunities to build that trust. Uh, it cannot be understated how much time and importance it is to give to that time that it takes to really understand and appreciate each other as people and to understand the different goals um, that and where we can come together and align for that out, those outcomes. Um, and also to set up a process that can inform planning and the timelines that different partners need. As you, um, as you heard for some of the ranchers and agricultural families, they're thinking in terms of how long does it take me to build my herd? And it's seven to eight years um, at a minimum after a drought and having to sell off their stock to rebuild to the point that they have their feet on the ground. Um, so thinking about those timelines is important. And that there, um, there's some long and some short timelines, right, that are interacting variables that play into that. And of course, look at scaling up. Um, as we learned from the Gunnison project, it started with one small uh, rock dam after another. And now they've built um, a couple hundred miles of those rock dams across the watershed and are really seeing the improvements to overall uh, watershed connectivity. And so thinking about start small, but build, build and grow on that. Those are kinds of the pieces that we've learned from the seeker that we're bringing forward. So let's talk about um, the Mancus project and give you a little bit more detail of what we're looking at here. Um, so uh, a big drought in 2012 and followed by a massive wildfire that sort of decimated part of our previous restoration efforts was a real wake up call to our partners. And the Mancus watershed partnership, which had started in the late 2000s, um, realized really quickly that their plan that they published in 2011 did not take into account a, enough of the aspect of change and change in multiple ways. The community is changing. We heard that old west, new west paradigm um, where our image of ourselves is still very much as an agricultural and traditional community, but the truth is that it's a mixture of recreation and tourism and second home development, amenity migration, which we're seeing a play out before our eyes right now. That's all part of uh, the New West that, and all of those partners um, 
need to be invited and included in our project. And so we have the Mesa, the Mancus Conservation District, the San Juan National Forest, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, uh, Mesa Verde National Park, local ranch, ranchers, the BLM, and then we have some very um, important specialists like Colorado Natural Heritage Program, um, uh, MTA is at the uh, Climate Adaptation and Science Center, um, Colorado Water, uh, Parks and Wildlife, and uh, Trees Water People, which is a wonderful organization that really specializes in helping um, tribal and, uh, and indigenous communities learn how to embrace their land and restoring the land as a part of building their culture. All these folks are at the table to help us figure it out. And so, yes, those are some diverse interests, but we're all looking at the same climate challenge. And as you can see from this map in front of you, as we think about uh, mid-century and beyond, we're seeing that we could, we have a watershed that's already over-appropriated that in an average regular year can run dry halfway through the watershed. Oh, if we could go back, Renee, thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's okay. And, uh, and so we're seeing we're predicted to see even less water. However, interestingly, we think from the projections that we might still see snow in our area. And so that has been the focus of how do we think about the future. And um, again, we formed a goal statement which tries to bring all those different values together. Um, so that we can support the native fish. We have the three, um, the, the special three fishes in our area, um, the bluehead sucker, the round-tailed chub, and the flannel mouth sucker that exist, as well as cold water trout up high. Um, and then we have agriculture that depends on um, 11,000 acres of irrigation water every year for their economy. And the traditions of the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, which um, really hold special, the cottonwood and the willows of the riparian area. So it's kind of diverse and it's messy and overlapping. So therefore we've come up with four strategies that really try to embody our work going forward. And uh, we're in the process of developing how we're going to play those strategies out across the ground. Next slide, please. <laughs> and how we got to those strategies, waiting for that slide to show up, is kind of have the four that are really important. Um, slow down water is kind of the first one. And it's how do we hold on to that increase um, groundwater and increase the residence time across the landscape in multiple ways. How do we connect the fish habitat? Because when the river dries up, those deep pools or the places where we have return flows from agriculture become even more important. How do we connect that? Um, looking to restore riparian areas um, is important and it looks different. In the middle and lower part of the watershed, there are some places that have beaver. In other places, beaver are not welcome on the landscape. So how do we learn um, through beaver analogs and others? And then of course, it's really important that we build community and cultural resilience. And so our project is looking for ways to unite um, generations, to unite culture um, through the way we bring people out to be involved in these projects and by trying to seek funding in order to create what we're calling the uh, restoration economy for the next generation. How do we build those skills? That's the four corners and pillars of the project that we're building. And we're excited to see it all come together. With that, I will turn it back to Renee and MTS. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, I just, I'll just, I'll turn it to MTS, but I just want to thank her once again with all these logos. A uh, lot of people involved, and uh, we can't do it without people. So uh, again, thank you. So I'll turn it over to MTS. Thank you very much, Renee, Andrew, and Marcy. Um, Renee, you did the near impossible job of uh, distilling this very big project in 25 minutes and I encourage everyone to look at all the reports and products that came out because a lot of work got done in that. So, um, so the time didn't do justice uh, in the webinar. Um, so yeah, um, we have some questions that were submitted um, to the Q&A, um, to the chat box, uh, but I will also meanwhile um, make sure that folks are able to unmute themselves and ask those questions. So we probably start with the, the questions that got submitted. Uh, I think this is for Andrew. Um, Robin O'Malley is asking, you know, you know, who really conducts and funds the monitoring uh, of these restoration projects that you're talking about? So, Andrew, would you like yeah. to take that? So, right. So, 
the Nature Conservancy used to be the stakeholder. And so, I mean, not the, the stakeholder, the project lead. And so about three years ago, they handed the keys over to the Upper Gunnison River Water Conservancy District, which is a mouthful to say. Um, and so they are kind of like, they are managing the whole project. And we contract out to, uh, to well, it's Renee Rondeau does vegetation monitoring and she leads that effort with uh, the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, she's got some former, um, uh, she's got some other, you know, retired uh, BLM, botanist, forest service. And then this year uh, we were able to get some soil moisture monitoring done. And so we contracted out with West Carolina University. It's the first year. Colorado Parks and Wildlife has uh, cameras to monitor use of these areas by guns and sage grouse. And Renee might have something to add and she leads this whole incredible expansive vegetation monitoring program. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if the question is who pays for the monitoring, it, it, it actually, as Andrew said, um, all these all these folks are putting dollars into it. Sometimes it comes directly from BLM. Um, it was from TNC um, and so Fish and Wildlife Service, NIFWF. Um, we got a Tracy Aviary grant to help with the monitoring. And so it's, it's really just pulling from these different pools of money and uh, which, which amount of dollars go to monitoring which versus what goes to actually building the structures um, it's a relatively small but not insignificant part goes to the monitoring. So uh, yeah, um, uh, I th I, we got to thank um, all the, the coordinators for, for figuring that one out. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, the other question is uh, from Teresa Chapman. Uh, if beaver returns, uh, beavers return to the area with restoration efforts, uh, what will happen? And maybe Marcy and others can take. Yeah, thank you. Um, the beavers are welcome, actually. And one of the things that's been an interesting conversation across our different stakeholders is um, in some places, uh, beavers as the natural part of the landscape are the preferred alternative, the preferred strategy, such as for the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. And it gets a little messier if the beavers were to move upstream on private land and into the valley where they might um, interact with some of the irrigation infrastructure. And I think the, the thoughts there are that um, what we would use in places where beavers are not welcome or beaver dam analogs and other strategies like that to increase um, the water being held on the landscape without the beavers um, being there to do their, their contributions. And um, we would continue to have, um, I think, the thought is that as the beavers are there over time, the community will learn more about how to work with them, how to live with them, et cetera. And that we'll be doing relocation programs um, to put beavers where they're welcome in the meantime. Perhaps we can take one more question and answer it quickly. Um, so, uh, it's from Tony Clem. How do farmers and ranchers in the area see the future economic viability of farming and ranching, uh, considering the struggles recovering from these severe and frequent droughts? I think that's a question we can answer for both the Gunnison and the Mancus, and I suspect the answers are the same. I think it really depends on who you talk about, and just like every other economy and every other small community in the United States, um, ranchers and farmers are looking at a changing world around them and trying to figure out how it all fits together. And um, the, the New West uh, reality is that there isn't actually these divisions anymore where someone is just a rancher or a farmer. Uh, we have a lot of ways that people are making money and trying to make it work. And so there's, um, it's important to think about all those stakeholders as both having a culture as well as an economy tied to that um, because ranchers are doing what it takes to be able to continue their life way as well as making a balance with staying on the land. Thank you, Marcy. I think we've just run out of time. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, to all our speakers today, and thank you all for joining our webinar, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Please take good care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.